All right, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate in this symposium. Um, Texas Heart is very close to my heart. This is where I first uh, did my uh, training in, uh, in the United States. So I have very fond memories. Today, uh, we're going to talk about perfusion in low and middle income countries, uh, staying out of trouble, um, not an easy task. Um, the format, um, I am going to take you through a few scenarios of uh, things that actually happen to us when we travel to our perfusionists. And uh, uh, we can, you know, go over the, the uh, uh, different uh, episodes and how to prevent them and how to be prepared for them. So um, the first one is what I call the too many cooks uh, syndrome. Um, and in some countries when we go uh, and they have their own perfusionists and their own heart surgery team that perform surgery when we're not there, um, this could happen if, if you don't set it up right. Uh, as an example, we had, we went to a country that performs pediatric heart surgery on their own and we were there to help them uh, set up the first or do the first uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, there were three perfusionists. One of our staff perfusionists, a very senior, very qualified individual, and two very experienced local perfusionists. Everything is going well. The temperature on the patient is 28 degrees. We're cooling down in preparation for deep hypothermia, circulatory arrest. Heart rate is almost nothing due to the temperature. Uh, the mattress is about 28, 30, and suddenly we hear <coughs> Big Bang. And uh, the Big Bang uh, was followed by a spray of uh, blood everywhere. And um, the uh, screaming by one of the perfusionists saying that, you know, the uh, oxygenator and the reservoir had exploded. Um, Clamps were applied to the lines. Uh, we give cardioplegia. We continue to do the procedure where, while the perfusionists change the whole setup and try to clean up a little bit of the mess. Um, and doing the investigation the day after um, a, a quality analysis, uh, we realized that one of the uh, vents for air had not been uh, the cap on one of them had not been removed. Uh, therefore, uh, air was uh, building up pressure up to the point in which it cracked the whole system and spray blood everywhere. So the two uh, take home lessons for this event was that there were too many cooks. Um, all of them were doing everything um, and because they're all qualified, and this happens in every circumstance, every scenario in which all the people involved are very qualified, everybody counts like on everybody else to do the right thing. And you stop paying attention as, you, as if you were the only person there. Um, and that brings it to what I um, always bring out in those countries. It's not the same to be responsible than to be accountable. We had three very responsible individuals. Nobody was accountable for who was the perfusionist for the case. Um, so um, interestingly enough, accountable is not a word that is easy to transduce or translate rather to any other languages or to many languages. Um, the other concept that especially is important for young perfusionists um, there's a phenomenon called the cognitive tunnel vision. It happens to surgeons. You're so concentrated in, in doing your task that you are not paying attention to the rest. And um, it's very important to have situational awareness, to know what you're doing, but at the same time to know and understand what everybody else is doing. Um, so from that trip on, at least when I travel, even if there are more than two or three perfusionists all eager to learn, uh, we decide ahead of uh, 
the profession who's going to be responsible and accountable for setting up the system um, and who is going to be answering one-to-one -one with the surgeon uh, regarding any problems that may occur during the perfusion. That's extremely, extremely important. On the second example, uh, let's talk a little bit about cardioplegia. As you know, uh, the history of congenital heart surgery, particularly uh, neonatal cardiac surgery, changed dramatically after the introduction of the del nido cardioplegia. I, know, I don't need to go over the formula with you. You're all familiar. You probably all use it. Um, but you do know that this is based on a solution of plasma light. And plasma light is uh, extremely, extremely expensive in any country. Well, it's not even available in most countries. Uh, but when it's available, it is about $300 or so per bag. So you will not have this unless, unless you smuggle um, in your luggage uh, bags of plasma light. And I have done it and it's pretty heavy. But uh, you're going to be offered um, two solutions to replace uh, plasma light in order to make the del nido cardioplegia. One is lactated ringer and the other one is chlorium, sodium chloride. My preference and the preference of many people I work with, many perfusionists, is to use sodium chloride. In this, in this uh, table, it, I don't think it's very complicated, but you can see the different components of each one of the solutions. And so a normal saline is just sodium and water. Uh, uh, lactate has um, two different types of sodium chloride, chloride and lactate. Uh, it has potassium and it has calcium. Uh, meanwhile, uh, plasma light has three different kinds of uh, sodium, sodium chloride, sodium gluconate, and sodium acetate. It has some potassium, but most importantly, it has absolutely no calcium. And that's one of the number one advantage of using normal saline. Uh, calcium, and if, you know, if you talk to a senior perfusionist, I have seen it myself 30 years ago uh, when cardioplegias were handmade and somebody had put calcium or too much calcium in it. Um, and you have the stone heart. Just ask people around you what stone heart is and how, what it looks like and, and how awful of a complication that is. And uh, believe me, you don't want calcium anywhere close to your cardioplegia. The uh, second difference is uh, uh, plasma light already has magnesium, um, which has to be added to saline or to the lactate, if you were to use lactate ringer. Uh, the other advantage of the saline is that the pH is closer to normal as it is the one for plasma light. And the same happens with the osmolarity, which is closer to normal as it happens with plasma light. So we have been using, um, so this is the formula that we use to reconstitute uh, the cardioplegia uh, del nido when we use uh, saline. Um, uh, you all have it somewhere, so we don't need to spend time there. Uh, we switch to do all our patients with uh, del nido cardioplegia in June 2016. So in reviewing the 100 patients before, uh, before using del nido, we were using uh, St. Thomas. Um, in reviewing the 100 patients before and the, 100, the first 100 patients, these are all 208 consecutive patients, um, comparing St. Thomas to Del Nido with saline. Uh, we were able to see a few things, nothing significant, which is a good thing. Um, the mortality, um, the mortality is about the same, slightly higher with St. Thomas, uh, with non-statistical significance. Although um, 
I have to make the observation that in the group of the NIDO patients, there were nine um, neonates, while there was no neonate in the St. Thomas. So I suspect that if these groups were bigger than 104 each, we will begin to see a tendency, and you can see it there, eight compared to 5%. Uh, the extubation, and we call early extubation, any extubation that happens uh, less than six hours upon arrival in the ICU or extubations in the operating room were about the same with a, a median of one and a half hours and compared to four and a half. Now, again, uh, these patients with median of four and a half that may look like longer um, had neonates in in them. So, and the inotropic support was uh, practically identical. So, no statistically significant on any of these variables. Um, what is really important is to observe what happens after 45 minutes of cross clamp, because to do an intraceptal defect or a ventricular septal defect with, you know, cross clamps of 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes is irrelevant what you use. But when the cross clamp goes above 45 minutes, uh, it's more important to have good protection of the heart. And uh, I will make two observations here, none of them with statistical relevance, but showing a trend, the mortality was higher for patients of, um, on the St. Thomas group than patients with the, the needle, um, again, Small numbers, not significant, but uh, significant enough uh, empirically, 21% uh, compared to 7.5%. These are only 37 patients on one group, 53 in the other group. Um, the second difference is on the inotropic support, you know, maybe something there. 24 hours later, uh, almost 60% of the St. Thomas patients were still receiving inotropes, only 43% of the, 43 of the um, normal saline del nido were uh, on inotropic support. The rest of the variables were practically identical, the same cardiopulmonary bypass time, uh, very close and, and cross clamp time, early extubation and median ventilation. So in conclusion, um, we decided that at least uh, using the needle uh, based on normal saline is not inferior to using what we used to use, which is the St. Thomas solution. And since then, we have instituted using the needle uh, in all our cases. Uh, this is a, another thing that you have to be very aware of. Uh, as a perfusionist, you manage these two drugs uh, every day. Uh, the, the main drugs that you will be using. And uh, we have had many issues of bleeding in some countries, uh, particularly when we don't use uh, manufacture, drugs manufactured in Western countries. And, and the reason is the quality control and the fractioning of the drug, despite of what is printed, may not turn out to be exactly what it says it is. So you have to be very aware. Um, and this uh, um, brings me back to 2013, uh, one of my first trips to North Macedonia, actually my first trip, in which we were doing cases, not neonates, um, uh, tetralogy of a lot, five or six years of age, and another child with some other two ventricular repair, that normally should be inconsequential. Uh, it has severe, severe uh, bleeding, so much that we ended up using um, factor seven twice in a week in two different patients, which I had never done before in 25 years. So we began to investigate what was the problem in these patients. And we realized that we had used Heparin and protamin, uh, not only they were not made in Western countries, we had mixed uh, heparin made in China, for, for instance, with protamin made in India. 
So that compounded the effect uh, of the inaccuracies of um, labeling and fracturing of the drug. So the solution, because the ACT, as you can see on the table on the right, the ACT is an approximation of your coagulation status is a very unspecific measure of where you are. And unless you can do tax, um, uh, the value of the ACT after the first hour is completely irrelevant, really. Um, so in that particular country, you know, they had the means to be able to buy a HEPCON uh, coagulation system and they uh, consistently measure after each bypass the amount of heparin still circulating and, and gave the corresponding dose of uh, protamine from whichever origin until there was no more circulating heparin. Uh, but if you do it empirically, you have to remember that excessive protamine, you can keep giving protamine, but excessive protamine also produces bleeding. Uh, so that's something to be aware. And I would uh, strongly suggest that when you travel to other countries and you have to use uh, these drugs, any drug, but particularly these drugs, which are your, your responsibility as a perfusionist, uh, you should try to use uh, USA, European, Canadian, UK, or Australian manufactured drugs. But if you can't, and you have to use what you can, you have in those countries available, try to use um, drugs manufactured in the same country. If you're going to use Chinese heparin, see if you can find Chinese protamine. Um, if you're going to use... Uh, Indian manufactured heparin use Indian manufactured protamine. Probably is, is the relationship is more uh, equal than uh, mixing from different countries. Something that affects you peripherally is the fact that in many countries, um, as it was here in America before 1989, the only product available is, is whole blood uh, taken from family members the morning or the day before the surgery. Um, and sometimes you don't have, uh, and this is very important postoperatively, uh, you don't have all the different components, individual components uh, of blood available for either priming of the pump to do FFP on rewarming, especially when you're doing a neonate, or, and the most important of all, the use of platelets in uh, postoperative uh, bleeding when you know that platelet is what is needed for the patient. Um, I have personally, and many of us have the same experience of being in a country in which there were not platelets when you ask for it. And you say, well, call another hospital, and they tell you, well, no, there's no playlist. I said, well, call the Red Cross. No, there's no playlist in the entire country. So your only resource is to use whole blood, which as you can imagine, if you're using blood, uh, you have to transfuse a lot to be able to achieve the number of playlists. And when you're doing this to a neonate, your hematocrit is going to end up being 70% if you're not careful. Regardless, of what you have or you don't have, my strong recommendation would be that uh, whether you use uh, whole blood for uh, blood priming or if you use packed cells, you always, always uh, check the potassium concentration when if they tell you this is fresh blood from yesterday because it's always higher than you expect to be. A little bit about the alarms, the alarms of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass uh, systems and the four top complaints that uh, perfusionists have about the alarms. One of the complaints is that all the alarms sound the same and make the same noise. And you can distinguish whether it's a low level alarm, high pressure or air in the arterial line. Um, the second complaint that low level alarm will not stop the pump. The third complaint that not every monitor parameter has an alarm. 
And the fourth one is that the operating room is too loud and you can't hear the alarm. Well, that's great and dandy, especially here in America. But when you are in a low and middle income country, we can guarantee that the operating room is going to be too loud. But plan to work without any alarm. Uh, line pressure alarms are a luxury. Uh, sometimes you have air bubble alarms and occasionally, for the most part, you have it. But occasionally, you don't have uh, blood level alarms. Which brings me to another anecdote from my last trip to Ecuador, a hospital that never had a heart surgery, not pediatric, not adult, first time ever doing the first ever case in that hospital, an ASD, 80 years old. And we had put everything together, we brought everything. And as we go and bypass, um, five minutes into it, I'm preparing to put the stitches for uh, the cardioplegia cannula. Uh, I see that the blood pressure drops to zero and the heart is empty. And what happens was that the, I was immediately informed by the perfusionist that was not expecting it. That there was a malfunction on the blood level alarm, but not a malfunction because the level drop and the alarm stop the several mechanism that stop the pump. No, the level was fine. It was a misfunctioning, a misreading of the alarm and trigger the complete stop of the uh, pump. So uh, the patient was basically exsanguinated into the pump. So we put the clamp on the uh, venous line, which is what you have to do. We crank uh, by hand, the arterial line until that uh, alarm cable, the whole system was ripped off um, and fill up the, the heart again. The patient was normal heart. It was beating normally. Uh, it was just empty. Um, the whole thing took, you know, 30 seconds. Um, but um, it's very scary because you can have a serious complication in a very simple surgery that you have zero mortality and zero complications. So uh, it's bad to work without alarms. It's even worse to work with malfunctioning alarms. You have to be aware of, of that too. Um, you know, on a different topic, um, this was related to me by one of our senior perfusionists, staff perfusionists, um, very capable individual. If he had been any junior or not so experienced, this could have end up in a real disaster. <clears throat> in this particular hospital, all cases were done for that day. The pump was clean as you should. The heater and cooler unit was clean and it was filled with sterile water or what they thought was sterile water. Uh, so he comes the next morning, the heater and cooler has been filled up overnight. Uh, he prepares everything for the first case and it's a small child, so it's a blood prime pump. And he begins to circulate it to make sure everything is working. And he detected a reddish color in the tubing going between the oxygenator unit and the heater cooler. Heater cooler. So uh, he stopped, um, throw away the whole system, empty the heater cooler, um, everything new, delay the case, of course. What happened is that that sterile water was not sterile water, it was um, sodium bicarbonate. And the sodium bicarbonate solution had uh, destroyed the uh, membrane and had allowed the blood to go into the heating cooler uh, tubing. Um, it's, it's one of those oxygenators in which everything is polyurethane, there's no metal. In any case, um, this, if number one, if the uh, priming had been with clear fluid, nobody could have detected that. And this patient would have been perfused with a solution of bicarbonate um, and probably would have had serious problems uh, with oxygenation and with uh, alkalosis. Uh, so that's number one. Um, 
This prompted me and others together with an observation that uh, Brian Forsberg, who's sitting there on the panel today, uh, observed that in some of his uh, uh, adult patients that were placed on methylene blue, and a very old way of keeping blood pressure after you exhausted all the other inotropes uh, that uh, you can think of, um, these end-stage uh, uh, heart failure patients on methylene blue, he observed that there was a contamination of a blue color in the heater cooler. So we uh, proceeded to do some uh, in vitro research in uh, Florida, and uh, we realized this is a, for cold storage of the uh, units for ECMO. We realized that after 13 days of storage, some chemicals like uh, methylene blue, like bicarbonate, um, may damage, seriously damage the membrane, allowing uh, the passage of the substances between the two circuits that should be completely isolated. And that leads us to uh, be able to uh, publish that data. And to, the intention was to make people aware that um, there could be other chemicals. To, I mean, we know for sure there are other chemicals that are used in um, cleaning the heater cooler that had potential uh, deleterious effect on the membrane per se. Um, so that's a very uh, important, I, I would recommend that you read this uh, just to, for, for reference and for, to uh, start thinking in a different way. Not everything is safe that you think is safe. Uh, we should uh, question whether other chemical compounds currently recommended for cleaning the heat cooler unit may be able to interact with the polyurethane membrane and do damage. And finally, I just, it's more like an empirical uh, thing, but if, if you have an experience, this would be good for you to know. When operating in low and middle income countries in severely cyanotic patients, we're talking about patients with hematocrits of 65, patients who have saturations that equal their hematocrit. You know, I recently operated a child from Afghanistan her hematocrit was 68 and her saturations were 68. Um, so um, upon termination of cardiopulmonary bypasses, as everything is fixed, you know, whether it's a old tetralogy of a lot, completion of the fontan, whatever surgery that uh, your surgeon is doing, uh, you should try to match the post pump to the pre-op hematocrit. And this will facilitate the postoperative management. And this is something that surgeons sometimes are not aware of. And um, you should um, not be uh, shy to interact and to um, make them aware of this. Um, this the thing, and, and this is, there's no proof, and uh, you know, we're trying to find a way to measure this. But we know that when you have a, a, a cyanosis for a long time, you develop more capillaries due to the low, ox low oxygen um, in all your tissues. And those capillaries are filled with this high hematocrit blood. If you fix the patient and the patient now can have a normal saturation and become a bypass, but you give the patient a normal hematocrit, 35, 40, uh, a bunch of those capillaries are going to be empty and there's not enough albumin or, or vasoconstrictors or saline or anything that you can give that they will fill up that bed the way that uh, high hematocrit does. And it will make a very difficult postoperative um, uh, management. Uh, and and if, if you are with Western trained uh, surgeons, nurses, intensivists, and, 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 you know, they're not used to thinking in these terms, they may end up with a serious complication um, because it's something that we here in this country, we don't see 
the 68% or 70% hematocrits every day. So that's just uh, anecdotal, uh, uh, no papers, no, but that's experience. And, and uh, I would recommend that, that you look into it. Um, so in, in closing, uh, thanks again for the opportunity to uh, give you this presentation. Um, I hope that uh, we are live there to be able to answer any questions. I'm sure you're wondering why my map is upside down. Uh, there's an explanation for that. And uh, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to talk at this uh, very nice uh, meeting. Thanks.